All right, folks. Well, welcome back. Um, uh, looks like, again, about half of you are watching these videos. Uh, what I'll do is, uh, for those of you who have watched this, I'll just, uh, uh, when we get back, when we meet again, when school starts uh, next week, just going to quickly recap this. Uh, and for those of you uh, who did not watch this, then um, these videos, then I, I will emphasize that point that you, you make sure you watch them uh, when you can to get caught up uh, with, because uh, we, we will continue uh, on when we get back with uh, chapter uh, 10. And you'll need this background information in order to understand what we'll talk about in chapter 10. Okay. All right. So basically what we're doing uh, in chapter nine so far is that we are analyzing the bonds between atoms in a, in a molecule. Uh, with these molecules and the way that they interact with one another, the, the way that the atoms interact with one another, uh, forces them to change how they behave when they're all by themselves. So the, the atom in its lone state, in its atomic state, when it's not interacting, electrons that uh, flow around it will behave in a certain way and what what happens then is when they start interacting with one another to form these bonds to form uh, these molecules here the uh, the atoms change the way that they situate their electrons and so what we do then and what we have been doing is we've been looking and we've been analyzing these bonds in a covalent uh, in, a, in a molecule very much like the one we have here in um, uh, carbon dioxide and so what we can do then is we can describe the, the type of interactions that we have here and also the, the uh, bonds, the um, hybridization, the hybrid orbitals that form in order for these bonds to form. And so what I'd like to do is I would like to continue with this analysis of carbon dioxide in this molecule to give you an idea of what you need to do in order to analyze the bonding in each one of these molecules, but also, and we'll practice this towards the end of the video today, if given a molecule, could you be able to describe the bonding that exists between the atoms in that molecule? And I'll go through the steps for you in order uh, to get that done. And so you have to be able to do that because what we'll talk about in chapter 10 is we're going to discuss then the interactions between molecules, these intermolecular interactions that then it helps us to understand the properties that we know of about of these molecules themselves. Okay? All right, so right now that we are looking at the molecular level, we're looking at an individual molecule and the interactions between these atoms here, which what we refer to as intramolecular interactions. So what we are doing is we are examining the intra, the interactions between the molecules, uh, between the atoms in a single molecule. So make sure you understand then that the discussion right now involves the interactions between individual atoms within a single molecule. Because what we'll do then is in chapter 10, we turn our attention to the intermolecular interactions, which is then the interactions between separate molecules. That explains then the physical and chemical properties for the most part of all these compounds, okay? All right, so with that said, then let's continue our discussion of the carbon dioxide molecule here. We saw then that the, um, that the hybridization of the center carbon atom is going to be sp hybridized. It, we, we know that then because of the bond angles, because of the angles of the, um, the geometry that it takes then, the electron and molecular geometry is a linear one. And so because it is linear, we know that it can't be sp3 hybridized or sp2 hybridized because of the angle here. But we're going to also realize, and, and I'll talk about this in just uh, towards the end when we summarize and wrap everything together is that the number of bonding interactions, <clears throat> the number and type of bonding interactions can also help us to deduce to a certain point the hybridization of these atoms as well, okay? All right, so carbon then is sp hybridized, which means that with sp hybridization, remember then the carbon atom here takes uh, its uh, s orbital and hybridizes it with a, um, a single p orbital to give us two sp hybrid orbitals, and that's what we have here. These two orbitals here, um, highlighted in blue, are the sp hybrid orbitals that are coming from the carbon atom. Okay. And so with that said, then there are two unhybridized, and there we have it, two unhybridized p orbitals on the uh, carbon atom. Here then we have then the unhybridized p orbital on the y-axis and the unhybridized p orbital along the x-axis, and we'll call this one the uh, z, I'm sorry, the z-axis here, sorry. Uh, Z axis, and then we'll call this one here the unhybridized or the hybridized orbital along the x axis, and that's what we have here. Okay. okay. All right. 
So with that said then, that helps to account then for how carbon hybridizes in order to inter, uh, form the bonds that um, connect it to the oxygen here. But where we left off with yesterday then is with the hybridization of the oxygen as well. We saw then that each oxygen here is gonna be sp2 hybridized. And remember we talked about this yesterday, and I had mentioned this previously, and that is we, when we describe, when we talked about Vesper, we described the geometry of a molecule. We described the geometry based upon the center atom here. But I did mention then that you can also explain the geometry of any atom within a molecule. And so what we did then is we were able to describe then the geometry around this oxygen here, which with its three, with its three electron domains, assumes a trigonal planar electron geometry, which means then there's going to be a 120 degree angle between each of the electron entities in this uh, atom right here, which based on that, then we know then that the hybridization will be sp2 hybridized. Okay. And so obviously the molecular geometry around the oxygen is going to be linear, obviously because it takes into account the location of the two atoms relative to each other. And so these two atoms fall along a straight line. So the molecular geometry around this oxygen is uh, linear, but the electron geometry, and that's what we have, that's what we're after here, and that's more important. Electron geometry is trigonal planar, meaning then that the angles between each of the electron domains, the two non-bonding, which are the lone pairs, and the bonding domain here, is going to be 120. As such, then, at 120 degree bond um, electron geometry with the trigonal planar, we know then that the hybridization is going to be sp2, okay? which means then with this electron, uh, with the oxygen here, it's going to have two, it's going to have um, uh, three sp2 hybridized orbitals. And so we see one here. Okay, there's an sp2, there's another sp2, and there's your third sp2 hybrid orbitals uh, for the oxygen here. And this is for the oxygen. This is for the um, uh, carbon here. And oxygen that has one unhybridized, we'll call it on the y-axis, unhybridized p orbital there, which makes it sp2 hybrid, hybridized. Okay? All right, why do we need to know that? Well, make sure you understand then that what we have here then for the carbon atom, then the carbon atom with its four electrons, and I'm gonna go ahead and change color here with its four electrons here, it's gonna have two electrons, one each in the sp hybrid orbitals, and one each in the unhybridized p orbitals here. Okay, so I'm gonna draw it in this manner here and here, okay. All right, so there are the four electrons in the carbon atom there. So carbon has the four, okay. Oxygen has its two and its four and its five and six here. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and draw uh, the lone pairs um, here. You have a lone pair here and there, occupying each in the S orbital, okay? And then you have then an electron here and in the final final lone electron in its um, uh, sp2 hybrid. So you have two, four, five, six electrons there for its valence electron, okay? The reason why we have this here is because if you can see then that the first of the bonds there, the first of the bonds here, and you can imagine this oxygen on this side doing the same thing as this oxygen. So I'll, I'll leave that uh, by itself, okay? So you can imagine here, there's this overlap here, an overlap between the sp hybridized orbital of carbon and the sp2 hybridized orbital of the oxygen, and it falls along a line. You can draw a line right there, and you can fall along the line, which means in this interaction here, this bonding interaction, one of these bonding interactions will be a sigma bond. So let's go ahead and write that in there. Okay, so with that said then, one of the bonds here, one of the bonds of that double bond will be a sigma bond, it will undergo a sigma bonding interaction, sigma bonding interaction. Okay? And that would be true then, and for this interaction there. Okay? So one of those bonds of the double bond will be a sigma bond. Therefore, the second, so if you take a look at this here, there's gonna be an overlap here okay? and, and right here. So the second of the two is a side-by-side -side interaction, a side-by-side -side interaction, Therefore, this interaction here is going to be a pi, which means in the second of these, of the double bond, is a pi bonding interaction. And that'll be true for each of these as well. So in a double bond, and we can, we can uh, pretty safely say this, in a double bond then, one of the bonds of the double bond will always be a sigma, and the other bond of a double bond will be a pi bonding interaction. 
And so that's the interactions. Those are the interactions between the carbon and the oxygen. Okay? So how did we do this? We First of all, we had to describe the, um, the hybridization of each of the atoms. Okay? So we did that. Okay? And then we saw then how the overlap occurs, how the overlap occurs. Here we have a, a linear overlap. Here we have a side-by-side -side overlap. And so let's go ahead and make sure we have, I'll write this down here, the pi bonding interaction refers to a side-by-side -side interaction. Okay, side by side overlap. Okay, and uh, with the sigma bonding, we have a linear overlapping. Okay, so we have a linear versus a side by side overlap, and that accounts for the difference in the types of bonding interactions that we have here. Okay, all right, very good. So with that said, then let me go ahead and save this really quickly, folks. And then with that said, then let's um, let's uh, let's continue on. Then, whoops, sorry, let me go ahead and clear this. Okay. And let's go ahead then. So we were able then to describe the bonding interactions, um, as sigma and pi bonding interactions, uh, based upon the overlap of either unhybridized atomic orbitals, uh, specifically the uh, p orbitals, and the hybridized orbitals for each one of the atoms. And we've talked about, we were able to talk about the sp. Uh, we just finished talking about the sp hybrid orbitals. Uh, we, we showed how, and we saw how the sp2 hybrid orbitals formed. And then we also saw at the very beginning how sp3 hybrid orbitals form. And so if you notice then, with each one of these here, it accounts then for uh, the number of bonds that can actually form. So we saw then when there are four bonds that form, and we saw this with uh, methane, when four bonds will form, you need four bonding interactions. Okay? And so therefore we saw then uh, sp3 hybrid orbitals. Okay? You have four sp3 hybrid orbitals there that account for the four bonds here. Okay? And so with that said, then, uh, we saw then that with two bonds and we, uh, with, uh, with uh, two bonds, two separate bonds here, we saw then uh, with, um, uh, sorry, uh, four here, sorry, okay. We saw then that with two separate bonds here, we needed sp2 hybrid orbitals, okay. So with that said, then uh, the carbon here formed two separate bonds uh, with uh, three separate bonds, I'm sorry. So we have uh, four bonds here. That forms. Okay, we have three bonds here that forms. Okay, and then finally we saw them with uh, carbon dioxide. Okay, the center atom forms two bonds. Sp2 hybrid orbitals. So you have two bonds that are forming. And again, it doesn't specify the types of bonds. We're just saying that the two types of bonds form here. We have two double bonds here, but if you have two bonds forming, you're going to have sp hybrid orbitals that will form, and this is re in reference to the bonds. Okay. Uh, three bonds forming, we'll need sp2 hybrid orbitals, and then with three bonds, uh, with four bonds, then we'll need sp3 hybrid orbitals. Okay. What happens then, um, so, and then again, you, we don't have any less because you don't have uh, just one bond forming. Okay. What happens then if you need a uh, you need to form a molecule that needs more than four bonds? Okay, what happens with the center atom when that occurs? Now we know that that can occur with certain atoms that are larger, especially with the uh, period uh, three and beyond elements. The period three elements can form more than uh, they, they can extend their octet, and thus forming more than just four bonds. We know that carbon can't do that because carbon has to adhere to the octet. Uh, so does oxygen. Uh, nitrogen has, uh, uh, for the most part, does as well. So therefore, uh, with, with one exception, when you have odd numbered electrons, and so, and then with fluorine. But with every other atom, with larger atoms, then we see then that more bonds can form. The question then is, if you have five bonds, five bonds that are required for the molecule to form, what type of hybridization is needed in order for that center atom to accommodate five bonds. Okay, so with that said, then let's go ahead and explore that possibility. Okay, let's explore that possibility. Okay, let's take a look at an example of a molecule such as okay, um, phosphorus pentachloride. Now, obviously with phosphorus pentachloride, and let's go ahead and take a look at this phosphorus pentachloride, then has to, the phosphorus atom is gonna be the center atom. Phosphorus has to form then five bonds, five bonds in order to accommodate the five chlorine atoms. So this is what has to form. Phosphorus can't be sp3 hybridized, first of all, because if it has, let's count the electron domains it has. One, two, three, four, five, six electron domains. Remember, six electron domains, if we, we, if we recall that, does not have the geometry 
that's necessary for sp3 hybridization because remember sp3 hybrid hybridization which is the most uh, we have so far assumes the center atom has a tetrahedral electron geometry which then is 109 degrees okay so that's for sp3 hybridization obviously here this molecule here will not take a um uh, uh, tetrahedral configuration, okay, and so that obviously cannot be sp3 hybridized, okay, so if you take a look at this here then, the phosphorus then has a trigonal bipyramidal electron geometry, uh, electron geometry. and go ahead and uh, review that and make sure you use your uh, the FET lab to help you consider that, okay, so the hybridization that the phosphorus undergoes has to first of all accommodate five bonds here, so you have one, two, three, four, five bonds, and this lone pair here as well, okay? And so it has to, uh, so the hybridization has to account then for one, two, three, four, five, six electron, uh, electron domains, six electron pairs, okay? Remember, sp3 hybridization only accounts for four electron pairs, and so we, we uh, this obviously cannot be sp3 hybridized. Now, with that said, then, the hybridization that the uh, phosphorus undergoes is what we call a dsp3 hybridization. Now, I'm not going to go into this particular hybridization in too much detail. You really don't need to know this for the AP exam. And unfortunately, what things they are this year, um, uh, they're going to be cutting down on this. But I do want to present this to you. But do understand this. If you remember then that if SP3 hybridization gives you four um, uh, hybrid orbitals, okay, four hybrid orbitals when they form, okay, SP2 gives you three hybrid orbitals and an unpaired uh, and an unhybridized P orbital, and SP gives you two hybridized orbitals and two unhybridized uh, orbitals. What we see here with ESP3 hybrid orbitals is that the atom, the phosphorus, phosphorus here, takes the S orbital, hybridizes, hybridizes it with all three of its P orbitals, and takes one of the D orbitals and hybridizes that as well. So with the DSP3 hybrid orbital here, with the, these here, you will form then five hybrid orbitals. And into those five hybrid orbitals, three, uh, you would fit then uh, hybrid orbitals. Okay. You can fit then these bonds here. And so you see then in our, uh, in our uh, picture here, then we have your one, two, three, four, five. And with the lone pair then going into one of the uh, unhybridized D orbitals. Okay. So I uh, remember with D orbitals, D atomic orbitals, you have five of them. Okay. And so with DSP3 hybrid orbitals, then what happens is um, um, the atom, takes one of those D orbitals and hybridizes them together with an S and, uh, and all three of the P orbitals themselves to give you this. So you have that here, your one, two, three, four, five hybrid orbital, orbitals there, okay? And it's through those five hybrid orbitals that the phosphorus then can take uh, two of its lone pairs, split it up, Put it into uh, one of these unhybrid uh, into these hybridized orbitals. The remaining three goes into the others, and so all five of these then will be also degenerate, which means then they'll be all equal in energy. With the one uh, with the lone pair then falling into one of the unhybridized D orbitals, that's going to be slightly higher in energy. Okay? It's in this way then that we can get that trigonal bipyramidal electron configuration that I just mentioned with the five equivalent hybrid orbitals. So make sure you keep this in mind then that what we have here is that we will have then five equivalent hybrid orbitals from a DSP3 hybridization, okay? All right, just real quick then, uh, just as a, a point of, uh, just as a, <coughs> excuse me, an opportunity to um, review, what would be the hybridization around the chlorine? Okay? What would be the hybridization around each one of these chlorines here if we have to account for four electron domains? Okay? Well, hopefully um, you were able to answer fairly quickly then that the hybridization on each chlorine then is going to be sp3 hybrid orbitals. And if you notice there, and if you notice for all of these chlorines here, they have four sp3 hybrid orbitals. So you have one, two, three, four. So each of the chlorine then is sp3 hybridized with the phosphorus center atom being d sp3 hybridized. Okay. All right. Very good. This in, clear up this. Okay. All right. So then let's take a look at another example here. Okay. And let's take a look at how xenon uh, tetrafluoride is going to be hybridized. So uh, let's go ahead and let's take a look at um, what we have here. Um, with the xenon, then, and let's, let's draw this out really quickly, though. With the xenon, then, xenon being the center atom, let's go ahead and, and I'm sorry, let me move this to the side. 
time really quickly. Sorry. So with xenon then, we know that in its atomic state, xenon is a noble gas with four pairs, eight electrons total. Because it has to accommodate four fluorines. Now remember, each fluorine is a has seven valence electrons, and we remember them with fluorine. Fluorine must, just like oxygen, just like uh, uh, carbon, just like uh, nitrogen for the most part, must have its octet. And remember, hydrogen must always have its octet. So fluorine can only gain one more electron. So if you notice here, xenon cannot form a corticovalent bond with each of the fluorines. So what must xenon do in order to uh, bond with the fluorine? Let's go ahead and take a look at this. You can imagine that if xenon takes two pairs here, okay? we're just going to arbitrarily choose these two here, okay? leaving these two un, uh, untouched, and separates them out into single electrons get okay, single electrons and in this in this uh, manner here then xenon then can bind with the four fluorines okay but which means that what xenon has to account for then is four bonds four bonds and two unbonded um, um, orbital uh, electrons okay all right so with that said then what we have here then in and I'm out of time here we'll continue this tomorrow okay what type of hybridization then would exist that would account for that would allow xenon to accommodate, whoops, sorry, to accommodate four bonds, four bonds, and I'm going to draw that here, and two, we have it there, and two un, uh, uh, non bonding electron, uh, sorry, notice this. Two non-bonding electron electron uh, two non-bonding pairs. Okay, so all right. So let's consider this here. We hopefully you can obviously the see them. Xenon cannot be sp three, sp two, or sp hybridized. Okay, so xenon cannot be any of those hybridizations. We saw then with the D in the last one with D sp three hybrid hybridization, we only form five electron uh, five hybrid hybrid orbitals. Okay. What we have here then is xenon, assuming, uh, uh, assuming that it does this, and again, this is a model, uh, this is the localized electron model uh, way to explain this. It has to accommodate then six, one, two, three, four, five, six electron, electron pairs essentially. Okay? And so the only type of hybridization then, if you can imagine, will lead uh, to that then is D2 sp3 hybridization. Okay. And so I'm sorry, D2 sp3, let me go ahead and that. Use it in the wrong place. Okay. So we have D2 sp3 hybrid orbitals, which leaves us then with six. We'll have six of these hybrid orbitals that are all equivalent. Okay. Six uh, sp uh, hybrid orbitals, and they will all be equivalent. Okay. Four. Um, and so with that said, then we'll have then an octahedral uh, electron configuration for this one. And so now, some people have argued in the past, and they, they, um, this is something that um, is a somewhat valid argument, then this could be a four, so you can have then um, a D sp3 hybrid with five electron, uh, five hybrid orbitals there, four of them um, uh, form the bond, one of the hybrid orbitals having the lone pair, and the other one forming, uh, uh, having the um, 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 second lone pair. However, when we talk about photo photoelectron spectroscopy at the end of this chapter, then we're going to see then that these two pairs here are equivalent. They are equivalent in energy, and so therefore they cannot they cannot have a, be in different types of orbitals. If this was in the d orbital here and this was in a dsp3 hybrid orbitals, they would be different in energy. Remember, the dsp3 hybrid orbitals are lower in energy than the d orbitals, and so the hybridization to, to argue then that this uh, molecule here, the xenon tetrafluoride, is a d sp3 hybrid orbitals would not account then for why these pair these two and these two are equivalent in energy the only way that we can conclude that they are equivalent in energy then is if they occupy the same energy level and the only way that you can fit these two in the same energy level is to have then d2 sp3 hybridization which allows then for all of these all six of these hybrid orbitals then to be degenerate and they'd be equal in energy okay 
All right, so um, so let me just make sure I, I point that out and we'll finish up this uh, and we'll talk about this. This electron pair here and this electron pair here, they are equal in energy, equal in energy. And so therefore, uh, the xenon cannot be DSP3 hybridized, okay? All right. Uh, um, so we'll pick up with this discussion tomorrow, and um, uh, we'll, we're going to try to uh, finish up with uh, uh, this uh, hybridization discussion. Hybridization. I'll work through a few examples for you, and then I would like to get started with uh, molecular orbital theory tomorrow as well. Okay. All right, folks. Have a good day, and then uh, well, I'll see you tomorrow um, with the new video. Okay.